This is Jason Hooten, head coach at New Mexico State Basketball. And this is episode 71 of the Talking Grammar podcast. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Jeff Grammer with the Albuquerque Journal, and you are watching the Talking Grammar podcast. As you saw, our guest this week is Jason Hooten, the new basketball coach, new men's basketball coach at New Mexico State University. Obviously, for, for those that follow college basketball anywhere, but particularly in this state, a uh, pretty unique situation that Jason's coming into, taking over a program that had its season shut down in the middle last year. And uh, he's, he's not just rebuilding the team like coaches talk about sometimes. He has a complete rebuild going on at New Mexico State. Every player on the roster is new. Uh, the entire coaching staff is new. Uh, he's, he's really genuinely rebuilding a program at New Mexico State and a, and a proud program, one that's had success, one that is starting new in Conference USA. So big, big task in front of him and uh, grateful for his time. I, this is all on me. This is not on him, but I've not yet met him. Uh, this is this podcast was the introduction uh, between myself and him. And and I was he was it was a good conversation. I think you're going to enjoy it. And uh, he, he does. And on some regards, have some high expectations to rebuild what was a proud program just a couple years ago. And on the other hand, doesn't have very high expectations. They were picked eighth in a nine team conference USA. I've seen them six or seven in a lot of other polls. So uh, you can look at it one way or the other. Uh, nationally, I don't think there's huge expectations for New Mexico State basketball. But as we know in this state and Aggie faithful certainly have some high expectations. So uh, he he's, uh, seems to be the right man for the job at the right time. And uh, I am pulling for him. I'm, I'm hoping that program gets back on track. And I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. I hope you enjoy this conversation. I hope you enjoy all these conversations on the Talking Grammar podcast coming out every Tuesday as part of the Albuquerque Journal Podcast Network. As always, give me your feedback. Let me know on Twitter at Jeff Grammar. Email ggrammar at abqjournal.com. Let me know what you think. Give me ideas for future show ideas, um, questions for guests, anything like that. For now, hope you enjoy this conversation with the new New Mexico State University basketball coach Jason Hooten. Jason, uh, thank you for for joining me. I, I before we get started, I'm going to tell everybody right up front that you've been here uh, in New Mexico since March, and uh, I have failed to uh, to get down to Crucis and introduce myself and and to meet you. So this is actually so so people know. This is the introduction. This is my introduction to you, and uh, we have not met before. So not, first of all, nice to meet you, and welcome to New Mexico. Thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, heard a lot about you, obviously. See a lot <laughs> on Twitter and I uh, know you do a great job with, uh, you know, the sports world and covering a lot of the schools here in the state. Well, I appreciate that. I will also, I since I have not annoyed the Lobo fans up here enough um, recently, I'm going to remind everybody and, and tell you that I am a New Mexico State grad. Uh, I was there when my good friend Brandon Mason was down there playing and... If you guys don't find a way to bring back these t-shirt these t-shirts this year. Oh, I love it. Let's see. Yeah, that's awesome. I was an original Panamaniac. Well, original, you know, 20 years ago. Well, shoot, 20 years ago. I'm flattering myself there. It's been more than 20 years now, but um Panamaniac t-shirts for the whole student section. If you guys don't bring those back, I'm going to be highly highly disappointed. You guys got to find a way. We're going to work on that. I'm going to work on getting the whole student section of some of those t-shirts. I think that would be a I think that'd be a great 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 twist right there. I, I know Mario can pull it off. Um if anybody can pull it off, it certainly is Mario. Would be that. Um, yes. <laughs> for uh for those that uh that are just getting to know you right now, uh, Jason was hired in March uh, after 19 years, and correct me if, if any of this stuff is wrong, um, 19 years at Sam Houston State, six as an assistant coach, and uh, 13 as uh, as the head coach. A um, couple really successful years that I'm going to get into because I'm a Ken Palm junkie, and uh, two really good seasons, one of them being last year. I think last year statistically, at least as Ken Palm goes, was the, was your best season at Sam Houston State. Um, 2015 was another one. I'm going to get into that kind of stuff and on the court in a minute. But who came with you uh, to New Mexico State? It it probably had to be after 19 years, a pretty tough decision to to leave the the home life that you had built um, in Texas. And uh, from what I hear, you may not even be the uh, the top coach in your family. You may not be the top athlete in your family. I want to I want to hear about the family life a little bit. Who came with you? Yeah. Uh, so it was a tough decision. Um, not from a 
you know, not from a job and a basketball standpoint, although it was still hard, you know, when you feel like you've been a big part of something and you've built or felt like you were part of something that has been built, it's always hard to leave it for sure. Um, you know, and it, it's in good hands with my associate head coach, Chris Mudge, getting the job, but it's still, still a bittersweet. I mean, you know, you, you feel like you're making a move that's great for your career. It's great for your family. Um, but at the same time, it, it was never, you know, it was never just a wham, bam, that's an easy decision to make. So, uh, but my family came, you know, when I got the job at the end of March, uh, it was right around the final four. And so I went back and stayed, stayed there at the house for a couple of weeks while, you know, we were recruiting and out on the road in that area a lot, cause that's going to be a big base of where we'll recruit from is obviously some tex Texas from our ties. Um, but at the me in the meantime, my family was finishing up school. Um, my wife and my children all went to the same school. My wife coached at that school and was my daughter's coach, and uh, she was a teacher. Ball there, so volleyball is that right? Yep, she was our volleyball and softball coach. Actually, she coached her in okay. both sports, and so they had to finish up school. And then, of course, I came back out and was out here uh, until about. Uh, I guess I was out here until June 1st by myself and okay. uh, was back and forth some, um, had a, you know, had a little bit of a family matter there in the, in, in the midst of that, my father passed away around May 16th. And so it was back and forth a little bit, trying to take care of my stepmother and doing some things there. And, but my family got out of here about June 1st and, uh, you know, it's been a, a really good move for us. The people here in Las Cruces, I can't, um, just can't talk enough about how friendly everyone is and how warm and welcoming. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I, you know, the comments that have been made to us about how we are you know, they appreciate us taking the job and, uh, you know, and just the fact that they feel really good about, you know, our staff and, and the kids that we've brought in and, you know, and the fact that we're going to try to get this back up on its feet. I know uh, the history of New Mexico State uh, is probably a big part of why you, you knew this job, despite whatever happened last year, um, probably knew that this job was, was a good one to take, and it's, it's respected. It is a program that is respected around the country. Is that, is that a fair statement? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, you look at the past, and there's not many mid-major programs that can say they've been to a Final Four, and now we all know how hard that is to do in this day and age. And that's not to take anything away from what had been done in the past. Um, but, you know, the landscape of college basketball is different for sure. And, uh, but, you know, just the, the crowds and, you know, as you said, the, the pain of maniacs and, huh. you know, and, and Coach Henson and just, you know, and I always mention him. But, you know, just there's been a lot of great coaches here. I mean, you know, Coach Jans did a fun, fabulous job here. And, uh, yeah, I just really felt like, this is a basketball school and I hate keeps to keep saying that because all of our sports are good. As you, yeah. as you can attest to that, our football team right now is probably going to end up having the best, probably the best season in the history of our program. It's crazy what's going and, on with football right now. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it, to me though, that's just a sign of, um, you know, I know we took a lot of heat there in the spring and, but man, that that's a sign of, of uh, health, healthy. That's a healthy athletic department when you've got yeah. you know, our soccer teams fixing to win the league our volleyball teams up in the top half I mean you're just looking at across the board at all of our sports and you know, that tells you a lot from the top right it tells you that we've had good administration and it tells you that you've got a good athletic director um, you know I always said athletic directors there's two things that they need to be really good at the first one is raising money and the second one is hiring coaches and, you know, if you're winning, then most of the time you're having the resources that you need in order to win. And, you know, uh, I just think hiring coaches is important. I mean, you know, there's probably a lot of people that, you know, didn't want to take a chance or, you know, didn't want to come in here and take this job. But I felt like that this was an opportunity that, you know, as you said, you just look at tradition and you look at the past and you look at the care factor and, uh, you know, even from a young boy growing up in the state of Texas, you always knew who New Mexico State was basketball wise. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to be at a place like that, you know, and again, that's not a knock on Sam Houston. Um, but I just think I just thought that no matter how good a teams we had at Sam Houston, 
when you hear Sam Houston, you think of football. And, uh, and again, uh, that, that, that was not a knock on, you know, here or there. It was just, it was just a simple fact that I wanted to go somewhere where people, they really, really care. Sure. I know uh, you said if an AD has two jobs and it's to raise money, Mario can take care of that. If it's about hire good coaches. Well, the pressure's on you now. Now you got to make sure that he looks good by, sure. uh, by, by you turning this thing around. Before I get more on the court, um, and, and you mentioned your father, um, the, the Texas Rangers, as we record this, are about to uh, play in the World Series. Uh, if, I, uh, if I am informed correctly, you are a big Texas Rangers fan. And uh, I think I've seen on Twitter that uh, was your dad a Rangers fan as well? Yeah, so uh, that's probably an understatement about how good, of, how big <laughs> of a fan I am. Um, so, you know, uh, when I the, the hardest two days, two of the hardest days of my life, obviously, were the day that I got the phone call about my dad and then the day that I had to get up and speak at his funeral. But one of the things I said was, you know, the fact that there's probably one thing you know, he, he was alive to see me get this job and he was here for the press conference. And I thought that was one of the, you know, one of the most special days of my life. And then, but, you know, we, we went through some tough times being a Texas Ranger fan. And, you know, I hope that he, you know, I wanted him to be here to see them win their first World Series. But, you know, he's got a good seat up there and, and hopefully it, it comes true. But, you know, baseball was a big part of our family. You know, my, my uncle was a professional baseball player Oh. And my dad was a good baseball player and a really good fast pitch softball player. And that's how I started to play fast pitch softball. And that was really important in our lives and our family. But, you know, that's kind of one of the first things that a, a young boy and a dad does, right, is, you, you know, you have those things that you do together. And baseball was that it was that thing. I mean, you know, he took me to a Texas Rangers game when I was about five years old and. You know, it was back when I remember the first game we ever went to was when Reggie Jackson played for the Yankees. And, uh, you know, I was back in the mid seventies, early seventies. So, you know, it, it was something that we always went to. Uh, I remember one of the first games we ever went to, we were driving around the stadium and this was before DF, they were just building DFW airport. And I remember driving, we were driving around and we drove out there, you know, and we were like, yeah, they're building an airport here, you know, and you, at that age, you don't even know what an airport is. <laughs> and, uh, it's kind of interesting how that all kind of turns, but that was an old Arlington stadium with the metal bleachers and you know uh, I think that weekend it was a four game series I believe we watched all four games and I think one of them it rained I believe if I remember one of them it rained real bad and so those are just memories that again I think most young boys and their dad has is you know going to a sporting event whatever that is but you know baseball was just kind of always in our family in our household baseball was just kind of what we did we sat and watched a lot of baseball and you know back then it was you know, TBS and Ted Turner on the, so the Braves were on every night and you either watch the Braves and the Rangers and, you know, maybe a little bit of WGN and the Cubs. Yep. But for other than that, that was kind of just what you did. And then I was a baseball player growing up. Uh, I played basketball, but I really didn't, I didn't fall in love with basketball until about ninth or 10th grade. Um, and I was pretty good when I was young, but baseball was just always kind of going to be the thing, you know, everybody in the family did it. Everybody told you that's what you were going to do. And, and, um, you know, and I had plenty of opportunities to play baseball in college as well, but there was just something about basketball. I believe, you know, sometimes when people tell you that you can't do something, um, that's usually when it, it kind of draws you to it a little bit more. And, you know, maybe that my personality, maybe who I am, maybe that's, kind of what drew me to this job as well. You know, maybe there are a lot of people that say, why did you do that? And you can't get that turned around or you can't get it back to where it needs to be. And so, you know, I've always been a person that's just been in, in, intrigued by challenges. It is a unique thing you're going through right now too at New Mexico State where it's a true rebuild. I mean, you know it better than anybody. It's not just a, a rebuild that sometimes coaches say is a rebuild. This is a complete rebuild, and that hasn't happened at New Mexico State in a long time. I'm thinking back um, off the top of my head here. I, I should have written this down, but, you know, Chris Jans took over a good program from Paul Weir. Paul Weir took over a successful program from Marvin Menzies, who took over a successful program from Reggie Theus. And Reggie was really the last, if I'm remembering correctly, the last rebuild when he took over 
Um, Lou Henson had to step down, and Tony Stubblefield was an interim head coach down there. And, and that was really the last rebuild here was when Reggie took over. And um, now – it was a different era. There's there's different challenges today than there there ever were. Some people say NIL and transfer portal makes turnarounds uh, easier. I don't know if it makes it easier. Uh, it just makes it different. Um, and uh, you you haven't had to New Mexico State hasn't had to rebuild uh, like what you're having to go through really ever. And even the closest second I think was was quite a while ago when Reggie took over. So you're you're undertaking uh, you're you're taking on something pretty uh, pretty unique. Yeah, I, I actually, um, I was talking to a really good friend of mine who was an assistant coach here named Russ Bradbury. He actually yeah. does color now on our TV and he and I have been friends for about 25 years. And I believe one year when he was an assistant, um, and I don't remember, it may have been that time when coach got sick, but, um, I, I, I just remember talking to Russ and they basically had to go get a whole new team. Yeah. Other than that, except for maybe the year, and I and I don't want to botch up history here and, and exactly who it was, but there was a team that had a plane, a plane crash one year, um, and I don't believe if it was Northern Iowa or Valpo or someone like that, I can't remember, uh, or Marshall or someone, um, but just remember that they had to complete rebuild. So this may be like only the second or third time of you know that that I know of a where you have to actually. Yeah. Yeah, where you've actually got to go in and get a whole new team. And, you know, I, I, you know, is the portal help it? Sure, there's no question. But I think it only helps it in a sense that you can fill a team, right? Not you're trying to fill a team, but you're trying to fill a team with your kind of guys. And I think when we took the job, how hard it was as far as the negative recruiting, you know, and, and I'm a person who never neg negative recruits because, first of all, it's not the right thing to do. And second of all, it'll come back around to somebody who's doing that. And we had a lot of people do it to us. And so when it's all said and done at the end of the day, you know, it'll come back around for sure. But you know, I, I think that part was tough because, you know, you didn't just necessarily go get, you know, 100 percent. You're not always in that situation getting the exact guy that maybe you would have gotten if you weren't in that predicament or in that situation before. And, and again, that's not a knock on anybody. It's right. just when you've got a year or two of recruiting, you're having an opportunity to actually go out and get to know the kid and get to know the parents and get to know what they're about and what they're like and what their coaches were in the past. And, you know, think about that in a year and two span. And we did all of that in basically two months. And so it makes it difficult. I mean, it really does. And there's no excuses to be made. We're excited about our team. We're excited about what we have and we're looking forward to the season. And, and, you know, I think we've, we've got a lot to prove. I think too, that people wondering, uh, you know, what you're about, what your team is about. I, uh, again, I mentioned earlier, I'm a Ken Palm junkie. So I, I kind of, I'm, I'm going to go through your, your Ken Palm kind of profile as I see it, you know, just looking at numbers on a screen. And you tell me how much of that is, is indicative of, of maybe what Jason Hooten basketball is and uh, how much of it is just sometimes a number's just a number and not as represent, representative of what you want on the court. Um, first off, at Sam Houston State uh, in the Southland Conference, most of the time of the past two years uh, in the WAC, you were – you guys ranked 73rd last year on final Ken Palm. And just for some context for, for people up here in Albuquerque that, that might be watching and, and want to know kind of what that means, what 73rd means. Uh, Utah Valley was, was the best team in the WAC last year, ended up ranked 64th in Ken Palm. They're the team that beat the Lobos in the NIT last year here in the pit. UNM uh, finished 66th, and you guys were out of the WAC right there at uh, 73rd. So, so right in that realm – last year is where you guys were and and with the 26 win season you guys had the 21st ranked adjusted defensive efficiency out of 363 division one teams so one of the best defensive statistically speaking best defensive teams in the country i i do want to bring in one other team for a point of reference here i think your 2015 um sam houston state team also a 26 win team that got up to 95th out of the Southland conference for people that don't know to, to, to be ranked in the top hundred in Ken Palm out of a conference like the Southland is, is an unbelievable season. I, I think that was, I'm guessing also one of your better teams that you've coached and you guys were ranked 58th in defense that year. So 
I, I look at the Ken Palm profile, and there are a lot of stats to, to look at on Ken Palm, but defensive efficiency, it looked like your best teams were your best defensive teams. Uh, is that is that sort of the calling card that people can expect from Jason Hooten basketball at New Mexico State? And what does that mean? Does it just mean stopping them from scoring? Is rebounding key? Is it shot blocking? What, is, what does that mean? Well, I, I mean, I do think that, you know, that is my background for sure. I am a defensive-minded guy, and you know, I think when when you talk about defense, to me, it, it has a lot to do with your toughness. You know, we've been very blessed to have tough kids that want to be coached hard and that want to play hard and do the things that we feel like are necessary to win basketball games. So um, it, it, it has been a mantra of mine. It's been kind of, you know, that old saying, that's what I've hung my hat on for sure. Um, and, and, and it's not just been last year or in 15. I think if you looked at our teams over the past 13 years, I would have to guess that we're probably somewhere in the top 50 or the top 100 in defense in most statistical categories. So that's something that we want to do for sure. Um, now, like most ca- coaches, Jeff, you know, the years like 15 and the years like last year, we always have guarded and we've always been consistent with that. But what made us even a better team and makes you a better coach is really good offensive players. (laughs) And, you know, last year we had the player of the year in the league in Quay Grant. And when you have a guy like that, that, you know, at every game and every end of every clock, you can give him the ball and he can go make a play for himself or somebody else that makes, it makes, it makes coaches look good for sure. And uh, yeah, you guys are, you guys are a whole lot better when the players are a whole lot better. Yeah, No, no doubt about it for sure. So, but we want to, we want to always be known to be a team that play it's hard to play against because our, our guys are going to be tough. Our guys are going to play really hard. Um, our coaches do a tremendous job of, of scouting the opponent and trying to take them out of what they do. Well, uh, I, I take a lot of pride in that because I was taught by the great Lon Reisman that if, you know, there's going to be a lot of nights when you're just not going to make shots. There's going to be a night when, you know, the, you just don't have it offensively. And I think those are still times when you can win and you have a chance to win and you give yourself a chance to win by being good defensively. I want to ask about tempo. I know tempo is a, a buzzword that uh, coaches, when they get hired, sometimes I know uh, Jordan Sperber uh, uh, had mentioned it, who's Hoop Vision, who has some New Mexico State ties himself, but he, he does a little compilation that he posts on social media every year. The the coaches introductory speeches and a couple years ago it was every coach saying we're going to play at a high pace we're going to play at a high pace and a good 30 new hires that year I think all said the same kind of had the same phrase and uh, I'm looking through the years at your tempo and and last year you guys were ranked 314th in tempo but you've also had teams ranked as high as 48th in the country in tempo Uh, is tempo something that just comes and goes with your roster or is there a tempo you would prefer your teams play at man that's Really good question. Um, you know, I think we all want to play fast. I mean, I don't think there's guys that just come in and say, you know what, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna play fast. But I think it, it just depends on your roster and it depends on your team. You know, um, this year, you know, I, I think we're not our numbers aren't going to be what I want them to be. I think this is going to be one of those years where you know, we're probably only going to play anywhere from seven to nine guys. Whereas our team last year, you know, we, we, we had a pretty good number of depth and we could play a little bit, you know, although that is a little surprising that we were that slow of pace, but, you know, I think it just depends. I mean, I think if our, if our team can be deep and we can play a lot of guys, you know, I'd like to get up and down and I would like to play faster and shoot more threes but I always tell our guys two things really besides the part that I can control. And that is our, you know, who do we have? Like, you know, who do we have healthy? Who do we have numbers wise? Are we deep? To me, the other part is controlled by the players. Right. And that's two things. I always tell them, if you want to run, then you need to run. Don't like, don't jog. If y'all are jogging up and down the floor, then we're not going to run. And then the second one is not turning the ball over. If we can run fast and we can take the shots that I want to take and not turn the ball over, then I want to play fast. But if we have a high number of turnovers and we're taking really bad shots, then we're going to play at my pace and, you know, I'm going to joystick it and we're going to run set plays and, you know, do those things. So I don't really have an answer right now. You know, we scrimmaged last week and, you know, out of the scrimmage, I think we had 12 really good or 16 really good transition opportunities and I think we scored at about 22, 23% of that, which is, 
you know, that's a little below normal. Um, so, you know, I, I think time will tell. Time will tell what we need to do. You know, um, last year, I probably slowed it down a little bit just because, you know, as good as Quay was, he also could get going a little too fast and we might shoot it a little quick sometimes. And then, man, we ended up having a team that I just can't explain how well they played together and moved the ball in the half court. And so, man, we were hard to guard. Um, and, and, you know, and like I tell, like I said, at the end of a shot clock, Quay was going and getting a shot or he was getting somebody a shot every time. So it just kind of worked out that way. Um, well, it, it's fair to point out, too, that tempo does not often, uh, I shouldn't say often, it doesn't always correlate to offensive efficiency. Um, Virginia is a, a great example of one of the slowest teams traditionally every year in the country that is offensively as efficient, you know, as, as any team in the country, and they play really slow. So, you know, just because you're playing fast doesn't mean it's an offensive showcase out there. Sometimes it's fast and sloppy. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, there was a coach that we used to compete against in the Southland, really, really, really good coach, and we always recruited against him. And he always used to tell people how good they were defensively, and they were, and he was a great defensive coach. But they also walked the ball up the court, you know, their, their goal was always, well, we, we hold people in the 50s, but yet, I mean, they only took 50 or 60 shots a game and there wasn't that many possessions. So it's easier to hold people low points, you know, and, and that's not my goal. I don't want to do that. Do we want to hold people low in points? Sure. But to me, the two statistics that really matter in that instance is field goal defense and three-point defense. And right. if we're holding people under 30% from three and we're holding people around the 40 percentile, uh, and field goal defense, I don't the the points will take care of itself, and a lot of that'll have to do, as you said, with tempo. All right, I'm going to jump in now a little bit to this team specifically because uh, it is a wildly unknown team to to me and to a lot of people. Um, you're you're getting to know them, uh, but it's probably somewhat still unknown to you. Um, I, I want to talk specifically some players in one moment, but one more question that I'm going to ask before we get into the players is culture. Um, if Pace of play is one buzzword coaches talk about in their introductory press conferences. You know, the culture is the other one. But but with you, there seems to be a little bit of a history of culture you, everywhere you've been. Um, I, I did listen in on a, a podcast you did recently with Adam Young, who, who by the way, is fantastic um, play by play announcer and, and everything he does for New Mexico State. Um, but you were talking about culture and, and things like eating in the cafeteria, going to class, as, as simple as some of this stuff sounds to people. It's not always happening uh, at every college basketball program. What, what does it mean uh, to, to build the culture to you and, and this program building a culture? What does, that, what does that mean? Well, first of all, I think it's a lot of fun um, because to me, culture is what you're about as a human being and, and you know, how I was raised by, by my family. Um, I think culture is, you know, what do we believe in? And, and it doesn't always necessarily mean just how my family raised me. I just think it's it's what are our morals and our values and what what's important to us on a daily basis. To me, that's what culture is, right? I mean, I think as a coach, whatever you demand is what your guys are going to stand for. And you know, when we brought these guys in, we told them from the beginning, like, hey, look, we're we're following one of the probably one of the toughest years of a college basketball team had, right? And so, when we come in here now, we want to build a totally different culture. Our cultures of, of substance, our cultures of guys that are, as you said, going to go to class every day. You know, um, I think last year, our, you know, the whole team was in online classes. Like, you know, if you're in a total schedule of online classes, how can you go and sit in there and get to know your professor? And how can you, you know, how can you get to know the students on campus and the Panamaniacs? Like, you know, you have to be a part of them if they're going to you know, they're going to appreciate you and they're going to want to come to your games and support you, then you need to be right there and amongst in the, in the middle of everything. So, you know, just, you know, eating on campus, like, you know, that's, that's giving money back to the university. Like, you know, I think all of those things, having some guys live on campus, you know, again, money back to the university. So to me, it's just, you know, the first thing I did, Jeff, I came in and I completely redid the offices. Like, you know, we didn't spend a ton of money, but we just came in and like, we just redid everything. We made it look like what we wanted it to look like. And, you know, what, you know, same thing with the locker room and, you know, uniforms and just stuff that 
you have to start with from the beginning. I think that's what culture is about at the beginning. And then from there, it's work. You know, what are our guys going to stand for? We're going to stand for coming and working hard every day, you know, holding guys accountable. Um, no days off. You know, I say no days off. There's days off, but when you're in here, you know, when you're in here, we're not taking a day off when we're here. And I think we want to get the most out of every day and try to be the best that we can be. So culture is a buzzword. Everybody loves it, man. Everybody uses it. It doesn't matter what sport or whether it's a player or a coach or whatever. But, you know, and again, everybody has maybe a different definition of it. But to me, I just think that what a culture is, is what you what you want your team to be every single day. Not just when things are going good or when things are going bad, but just every single day, you know, what are we going to be like? We're going to get up. We're going to come to practice. We're going to work hard. You know, we're going to do the right things. We're going to, you know, study and get our degree and do all those things that, you know, because in in the end, ultimately, we all want to win. I mean, nobody wants to take a job (laughs) and not win. Uh, But ultimately, we also need to win in life. And I think that's what we got to teach these guys is, you know, and this is not coach talk. I mean, it's true. Like when they leave here, just no different than my kids at home. Like when my kids go off to college and they finish, like the most important thing to me is that they can take care of themselves and that they can go out there and they can be, you know, they can be a citizen that has a wife and kids or whatever significant others. And they got children and they got a house payment and a car payment and you know, they got a job that they love, right? That's what, like, people say all the time, do you know, what about your job? I don't really, I don't have a job. Like, yeah. this is this is what I love to do. And I think when you really, truly love something, it doesn't really feel like work to me. I know I get paid to go watch college basketball, and sometimes I'll come home complaining about work, and my wife has Hello to remind job. me. Yeah, I mean, what, what did you do today? You got you. Oh, yeah, that's right. You watched games. So, uh, yeah, I, I get put in my place sometimes when I complain. Love Luckily, it. I don't complain too much about it. I'm I'm pretty grateful myself. So, love it. Um, let's talk about this team a little bit. I, I will I will start with uh, the waiver uh, situation, which is is hitting your program uh, with two pretty key players. If I'm not mistaken, there's still two waivers that you guys are waiting on. Um, the the first one seems to me to be what could be a major swing for this program. I'll see if I get his last name right. Uh, Femi Arukale. Pretty good. Pretty close. A yep. um, couple seasons at Pitt, couple, or played last year at Seton Hall. He's a Brooklyn kid. I, I'm guessing he's a tough-nosed guy. That's a little generality from where he played and where he's from, but uh, six foot six guard. Uh, is he going to be suiting up for the Aggies this year? Oh, man. I wish I had an answer for that right now. Um, I, I do think that you know, if that if that waiver does come through, it'll definitely help our team, you know. And, you know, Jeff, when I got the job, we kind of knew that there would be a chance it might not happen. But, you know, anytime you can take a young man like that and just, you know, I thought we were in a position this year where we, we could just take a shot and see what yeah. might happen. And, uh, you know, he's been really good for us up until this point. The great thing about him and which I really love about my players is he he can play one through four and you know i i don't want to always play him at the four because he's six five six six he's really a guard but man he's so strong and athletic that there's just so much that he can do on the floor and you know right now in practice he's our backup point guard so just a lot that he can do and he's a really good player and you know we're i mean any day now we could get a phone call and uh you know we've put the stuff in and we're just waiting on the NCAA right now. Um, you know, he has a, a tremendous case, but I don't know what it takes. I've seen, I think there's right around an 18 or 19% win rate right now. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've seen guys that have gotten them and we've all looked at each other on a staff and said, how did that guy get that waiver? Right. Because we know him and we, we recruited him. Like we recruited him, we turned him down because we knew what his story was and we didn't feel like that story was what it would take, right? Whereas Femi, I mean, his story is amazing. You know, I mean, he and I actually, we've kind of got the same kind of story. I mean, he lost his father in the middle of his season. And, you know, I lost my father right after the season. So, um, you know, he's, I think he has a a great case and we'll just kind of see what happens. He is too a guy that, um, as I said, I I think will be a a big swing for you guys. I'm curious how he's handling practice right now with that uncertainty. Is, Is he... Is he practicing as though he's going to be playing? And, and and how has he been not knowing yet if he's going to play? Yeah, it, it's been, you know, I thought early in the summer um, or late late in the summer when we started working out, 
we, I thought he was pretty engaged, you know, and as time went on then you know, we lost a little bit there. And, but here in the last couple of weeks, I thought he's, you know, as we get closer to being able to play, he, you know, he's been really engaged and uh, you know, he's practicing as an if, you know, but I think he, you know, it'll be tough. I mean, if he doesn't get that waiver, then, you know, obviously we need him to come in every day and try to push these guys and help them get better. All right. Your other guy that is uh, sitting on a, a waiver request right now to uh seven footer that alone um, indicates that he could be a, a, obviously a big part of the team, but um, Davian Bradford uh, he's played at both Wake Forest and Kansas state and, and has had some, some good seasons with them. Uh, I'm curious where you're at with, Davian Bradford and his waiver and just his uh I guess is he ready yet to play I know he probably has to get into a little bit better shape right now but um that could be said for a lot of players right now too probably so um where do you stand with Davian Bradford right now yeah he came in you know he was pretty pretty out of shape when he got here and overweight um I think we've got him down I think he's lost like 22 pounds and I think right now he's like right at 289 um which is still about 20 probably about 20 pounds, 25 pounds overweight. But, you know, each day he just gets better and better. And yesterday, in fact, was his best practice he's had since he's been here. And, you know, this guy's a really good player. Um, now, with him, I knew I didn't care whether he I got it or not. I knew that we, were, we wanted him and we were going to take him and sit him out because, you know, to have a guy like that in your lineup next year, you yeah. know, and, and he'll be 250, 260, he, he's going to be a problem in Conference USA. Um, it's interesting because he was at K-State with Casey, and so Casey and him were teammates that first year, and now Casey's a senior for us, and if Casey leaves, then he'll just step right into Casey's, you know, Casey's position. So um, Davion's a good kid. He's, he's working real hard, you know, I, I think, again, I think he's got a good mindset that if he gets it, great, and if he doesn't, great. So I, I think he's in a good spot. You mentioned Casey. He's the next guy on my list because he is the guy that came over from while well, he did play at UTEP. He did play at K-State. As you mentioned, he was with you last year at Sam Houston State. Six foot ten forward listed as a forward He's probably going to be playing the five for you, I imagine. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious what people can expect from Casey. Let's see if I get his last name right. Eziagu. Yep. Eziagu. Yep. Um, what, what, what are you getting him? Yep. And to help you out, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but there's no such thing as a center anymore. Uh, all the centers <laughs> want to be listed as forwards. So they're, they're all stretch, guards. stretch fours, right? We have guards and forwards. Now I haven't seen a center listed on a roster in a long time. So, yep. um, anyway, now Casey's, you know, Casey's outstanding. I think the the greatest thing about Casey is the person that he is. Uh, you know, I've never been around a high, more high character guy. Uh, than Casey, you know, he's about the right stuff. He comes in every day. He works really hard. Um, you know, he takes care of his body and you know, he's had a couple of knee surgeries and, you know, he's not as fleet of foot as he once was, but uh, just again, works really, really hard and does all the things necessary for him to stand up and be, you know, be in a position to, to play a lot of minutes. And uh, he's been great. He's been a good leader. He's talked, um, you know, we have so many new people that, these guys are all trying to learn our system. They're trying to learn, you know, what I want, but they also are, are trying to learn, you know, you know, just me day to day. And I think sure. Casey's been able to help them with that, you know, and what coach is looking for and, you know, what kind of mood is he in today. And yeah, I think all of that stuff is kind of important. And Casey's been, he's been tremendous with our guys. You guys, I'll, I'll hit three guards that I, I'm going to name that I, I think could have a good season for you real quick. I, I'd say you guys are guard heavy a little bit, maybe not a lot of size, but your guards are big in general. Uh, Brandon Suggs, a guy who's played uh, uh, Central Florida, I believe. Uh, Jordan Rawls, Jalen Jackson Posey. Th those are three guards that I, I think could have good seasons for you. I might be missing somebody. I might be wrong on one of them. Um, tell me a little something about your guard play. Yeah, no, so I think for right now, those are three guys that will start for us probably. And, uh, you know, we um, haven't gotten all together yet. You know, uh, Suggs has been a little bit banged up. And so there just hasn't been a lot of days where we've had all five guys on the court. Um, Rob Carpenter hurt his foot about three or four weeks ago and hasn't practiced or played. And so I just hadn't seen what our team would look like, you know, with everyone in there. Um, 
but I, I do think we're, we're pretty guard heavy. Uh, I do think we have a little bit of some depth there. You know, Posey's a tough, hard-nosed kid. He fits the profile and what we look for. Uh, he, I would be shocked if he's not one of the best defensive guards in Conference USA. Um, you know, Jordan Rawls was a guy that we felt like he's, you know, he played a lot at Western Kentucky and had real good numbers. And I uh, just felt like, you know, that familiarity with the league and that level, I thought, you know, he was a guy that could really help us. And, and he's done a good job. And then, of course, you know, Brandon's 6'6", and he's a legitimate guard. And, you know, long and athletic and can really score the basketball. And he's got good numbers. You know, we stat practice every day. And up until this point, he, he's done a really, really good job at his field goal and three-point percentage. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy with those three guys. And then, you know, Jaden Harris has really surprised me. And, you know, Christian Cook has really surprised me. So those two guys, I think, give us extreme depth in that area. And, you know, now you're looking at already five guys and you haven't put Femi in there. So if you have a chance to get Femi in there, now you have six guys that you could play in three different positions. And so I'm pretty pleased with that if it works out that way. You know, now if Femi doesn't get his waiver, you know, maybe we're a body short in there somewhere. But for the most part, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, with that position and, you know, we, we need, I would like to have a little bit more depth at the power forward spot. Um, you know, our backup center is a guy who's never played on this level before and he's getting better every day. And I do think for it's all said and done, he'll help us a lot. Um, and then again, I just would like to get Robert Carpenter out there so we can see what he can do when, you know, when it all starts to starts to get going. All right, Jason, I'll let you go with this. I know you got to practice. you, you got to get to, and, and first of all, very gracious with your time. I'm very appreciative of it. Uh, you guys were picked uh, in the 6-7 range, depending on what magazine or preseason poll you look at. it. I think you were 6th or 7th in the actual official Conference USA poll. Probably a fair guess, because for a lot of us, it is a guess. We just don't know much about your team. But where? Uh, how does that eat at you, uh, knowing you were picked in a in a nine team conference USA uh, towards the bottom half? Not at the bottom, but uh, are you okay with the fact that you realize your your team's a relative unknown, or does it eat eat at you a little bit? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, you'd have to say you, you know, I think you'd be lying if you said that didn't eat at you. I mean, you know, we were picked eighth actually out of nine, and uh, Coach Harper at Jacksonville State and I were laughing at Conference USA Media Day. I was like, man. These people got no clue. You know, they picked you, they picked you behind me. I was like, man, they should have picked you eighth, if anything, and I should have been ninth. And he laughed and said, no, you know, but we, you know, all jokingly, I mean, my our last two years in the WAC, you know, the first year we were in the WAC, we were picked seventh, I think. And we finished what, tied for second. And basically, yeah. if we would have just won one more game, we would have finished first. And it was that close, you know, and, you know, at the time, New Mexico State was they were the they were the champions. And I think we beat them at our place by 25. So we were right there. And then the next year, you know, I kind of thought, you know, man, you know, we lost Savion, who was really good. But, you know, I thought, man, I got a lot of guys back. They're going to yeah, they're going to pick us in the top four. And then last year they picked us sixth. And, you know, we finished tied for first with Utah Utah Valley and uh you know we only lost a couple of games in conference so I, you know I don't know I mean I, to me I think nowadays I think if it was five or six years ago you could probably get P PO'd a little bit about it yeah because there wasn't a portal and there wasn't a bunch of setting out guys but nowadays you know when you got a portal and you like you have no idea what people got on their roster you don't like, even when you're getting ready to scout people, like the first couple of games of the year, you don't know what those guys are. And, you know, you might know they were at UConn last year or Seton Hall, but you know, once you get them to your place, you just don't really know. I think the only way you can pick people to finish is if they have a bunch of guys coming back. And to yeah. me, that's when you say, okay, you know what? That team needs to be picked first, second, third, fourth, or fifth. Cause they got six or seven guys back. Right. And this time next year, you know, we'll have six or seven guys back and feel a lot better about ourselves than maybe we do right now. But, yeah, I mean, eat at you. I think I've never been a person that needed a motivating factor. Like, you know, I always tell guys this, like, 
my motivating factor is just every day I wake up because, you know, my father was a big sports person, but my father was a construction worker for the same man for 40 years. And, you know, my uncle was a great pitcher. He pitched at Rice University. He's the first pitcher in the history of uh, Rice University that beat the University of Texas. Um, he, he beat the University of Texas, and that was like the first person that ever did that. And, you know, so, I mean, sports is my uncle played linebacker at TCU. Like, sports has always been in our family, but never nothing has ever been given to me in sports. You know, I played at a Division II school or NAI school, JUCO. You know, I started out as a assistant coach at Tarleton State when we were NAI non-scholarship. Like, you know, it, it's to me, it's just a motivating factor, the fact that I'm blessed to be sitting where I am on a daily basis. And so... You know, that stuff doesn't really, I don't know, doesn't. I'll remi- well, I'll remind you of it at the end of the year if you're higher than uh, than, than the preseason polls. And, uh, Man, I'll let- I'm not higher than eighth at the end of the year. I'm not going to be a very <laughs> happy guy. <laughs> you may not take the call if I'm calling you at the end of the year. I'll take and you're- call, but I may not be very happy. Shoot. Jason, I appreciate it, man. Uh, it, it's been nice meeting you. I appreciate you for doing this. Um, good luck this season. I, I know there's a lot of people in Las Cruces and around the state of New Mexico that uh, that are Aggie fans that that could use could use a good season out of you guys. And that doesn't necessarily mean winning every game. It just means uh, let, let, let's get through the season and let's do it the right way, the way you've been talking about. So hopefully that happens for you guys and a lot of people around the state that could that would really appreciate it. And uh, um, I'm I'm rooting for you guys, man. Uh, I'm I'm still an Aggie, so uh, well, hopefully you guys uh, hopefully you guys play pretty well. No, I appreciate it. I know you're up there in that Lobo land, and but I also know where your heart is. So you're you're welcome. You're welcome back here and down here anytime. <laughs> so anytime, we'll see how the we'll welcome. see how the Lobos uh, treat me after this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I know this. They don't need any help. That's for sure. Uh, they yeah. got a great team. They, they should be pretty good. good players. Coach Patino does a, a fabulous job. I, I was lucky enough to watch a lot of their games last year because they played at nine o'clock in Texas time, you know? And so after I got through watching film or got home from practice, you know, laying in bed and watching some TV and watching some games, I've, I've watched, man, I bet I watched them play six, seven, eight times last year. And, you know, that league is so good with, you know, Boise State and Colorado State. I mean, there's a lot of good basketball teams in that league and games. So they got a great team and he's a great coach. So they, they don't need, Jeff, they don't need any help over there, man. <laughs> <laughs> come down jason appreciate you thanks for your time man all right hope you enjoyed that conversation with jason hooten uh went over a lot of ground there covered a lot of ground on the the new brand new to a lot of us team down in las cruces the new mexico state aggies that uh entirely new roster every player is new every coach on the staff is new so um had a lot of ground to cover there um, appreciate him for talking about family life, uh, his father, the Texas Rangers, and uh, and all that. Uh, wishing him and, and the Aggies a lot of luck this season, and I hope they I hope they do get some things turned around down there after what happened last year. Be good for the whole state. Be good for a lot of people in the state, a lot of fans. So uh, appreciate him for giving me some time before his practice, and appreciate you for listening and watching this podcast and all the podcasts that are a part of the Albuquerque Journal Podcast Network. Every Tuesday, this one comes out, the Talking Grammar Podcast. We also have the Midweek blitz which is our high school football podcast that james yotis is uh is manning the ship on now and and doing a great job with so as always appreciate your feedback and your comments about the show hope you're subscribing subscribe on youtube you can subscribe on apple podcasts spotify wherever you get your podcast if you're a listener or a viewer hit that subscribe button uh it'll help us out also you can subscribe to the albuquerque journal at any time abqjournal.com slash subscribe is where we have all our offers available to you um available to readers and you can subscribe digitally you can get the print version whatever you want it helps us out support local journalism support a locally owned business in the albuquerque journal and it helps us bring you shows like this podcasts like this put also all our content all our game coverage uh digitally at abqjournal.com and in print so as always, uh, you can get me on Twitter or X at Jeff Grammar, or you can email me ggrammar at abqjournal.com. Thank you for listening to this podcast and all the podcasts. Until next time, thanks for listening.